All right, we are going to be in Mark chapter 6. So if you brought your Bible, Mark chapter 6. <clears throat> now, as you're turning there, or if you uh, weren't here this morning, uh, what we are doing is taking our sermon from this morning and uh, going over it again, but going over in greater detail to see what, um, to see just things that after we've marinated, hopefully over the, over the course of the day and just thought of some things uh, that maybe we read throughout the scripture so that we can discuss and have, have better application uh, with, with what is being said. So if you're taking notes, Mark chapter 6, I want to give you three chapters in Matthew, Mark, and Luke that all record the same day. Uh, they don't record all of the events, but together they give you all the events and give you the course of a 24-hour day. So if you're taking notes or you're writing in the margin of your Bible or if you just want to file it away in your mind, Matthew chapter 14, Mark chapter 6, and Luke chapter 9 are the chapters that if you want to go further in your reading and the further of your study uh, of what we're going to discuss here tonight, you are more than welcome to do that. Each one, again, gives you different perspective, gives you different detail, but they all record the same day. And as, I, as it was mentioned this morning, uh, this is a 24-hour day from what we can piece together. So this is... Uh, this gives you a full or complete day with all sorts of things that are going on. So I just want to go over one more time of everything that was discussed in Jesus' life. But before I do that, I wanted to read something because I didn't get a chance to read it this morning uh, like I did, uh, like I wanted to. So I had to, I had to cut it out, but Amory told me it would be okay to read it uh, tonight. So in the great book, Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day... It opens up this way. I went to sleep with gum in my mouth, and now there's gum in my hair. And when I got out of bed this morning, I tripped on the skateboard, and then by mistake, I dropped my sweater in the sink while the water was running. And I could tell it was going to be a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. So what I loved about the book, uh, and what Emory reminded me of uh, as we talked about, and I asked her, I bounced it off of her whether that was a... a appropriate to bring in, because I know it's a children's book, is just how many of us go through things, and we are just like Alexander. I can just tell. My day hadn't started but for the last five minutes, but I can already tell it's going to be a bad day. Uh, and many of us have been there. We've probably said it out loud, but I like him. He rides in the car with his brothers, and he sits in the middle, and he is squished, and he is smushed, and he says, I don't have anywhere to sit, and no one listens to him. It's going to be a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. He eats breakfast with his brothers, and his two brothers got toys out of their cereal boxes. All he got was cereal. It was going to be a terrible, no good, uh, very bad day. He went to school, and his music teacher told him he sang too loud. His math teacher told him he forgot 16 when they were counting to 25. And then he says, in the middle of the book, I'm going to move to Australia. Just want to get away. I'd encourage you. I just wanted to bring that up because it just puts into perspective that we've all been there. Uh, whether it is, I think, Scott, I know you mentioned this a couple of times uh, in February. You forgot to put your cup with your coffee. Uh, and I, that was just something that who hasn't forgotten uh, their cup and uh, putting it with their coffee and just the coffee's everywhere. But it's just going to be a very bad day. We've all been there. Whether you said it out loud or not, you've thought it. And all I wanted to do with the sermon this morning is just show that Jesus had the same thing. I think one of the things that is hard for us to wrap our minds around is when the Hebrew writer tells us that everything that we deal with, he had to deal with himself. Whether it's temptation, whether it's trial, whether it's test, or just in the day-to-day -day grind of life, he had to deal with stuff as well. So I want to give you an overview, just remind you of just this one recorded day, and, and I would say... It is considered to be the second worst day of Jesus' life by scholars and commentators. But in this one day, he opens up that day with rejection at Nazareth when he goes to the synagogue to preach and to teach, and he's rejected. Immediately following that, he's got to send the 12 out on a day mission because time is short. We've got to, we've got to get going. We've got to get moving. So he sends them out, which means that his family that normally would flank him and help him uh, probably be a support system to him, is not available. As soon as they leave, the way that it reads in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the as soon as, he as they leave, 
he receives the news that John the Baptist has been beheaded by Herod. Whatever happens over the course of that amount of time, the twelve come back and they're very happy. They're excited. They've cast out demons. They've done amazing things that they want to tell Jesus all about it. But it's already late in the day. So he's got to feed 5,000 men, not counting women and children. And then, when he finally gets a break, he sends the twelve in a boat on the other side of the sea so that they could maybe, maybe, get a little bit of rest, only for the twelve to be caught in a windstorm, and they make painful progress, is how one tra translation will put it. So he goes down to help him. He has climbed the mountain to pray, and he leaves the mountain, and he goes down to the sea to help him, which is a great thing. But most of you have a, trans uh, most of you have a little footnote in your Bible that should tell you, uh, in, and Matthew, Mark, and Luke should have this footnote in all three of them, that the moment that Jesus went, the time of day that he went to go down and help the disciples in the windstorm is between the hours of 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. So tell me, what are, some, what are some of the emotions? What are some of the things that Jesus is dealing with? Remember, he's gone from rejection. That's how his day began. So I would classify that as a very terrible day. I could tell it's going to be a bad day, perhaps, that may be what he would be tempted to have. But it's, it opens up with rejection, and it ends with a salvation. But people need him over and over. So what, what's he feeling? I know the scripture doesn't tell us a lot, but if he's a human being like you and I, and he is, what's he feeling? What are some emotions? What are some things that are going on? Okay, anxiety. Okay. Anxiety. Exhaustion. Again, we're looking, and it, Scripture doesn't say, so I take a little bit of assumption. I've got to take a little bit of liberty, but I'm going to assume at best he's probably napped. And at worst, he probably hadn't slept at all. So, that, so you're, you're right. You've got, and it's not just physical exhaustion. We would look at mental, emotional. Uh, so you're looking at a lot of exhaustion. Somebody raising their hand. Yes, Brittany. Sadness would be one. Grief, because he just lost his cousin. Okay, de-energized. So whatever he did have, it's, it's quickly gone, or at least it's being spent and it's not being replaced as quick. Okay, what else, Jeff? Okay, that's a really good point. So I didn't think about that angle because I, I just immediately went what most of us would, the grief and the sorrow. But you're right, whatever he's feeling, he, he would maybe be anxious a little bit. Are, are we next? Are the 12 next? Uh, what, if you didn't hear what Jeff had to say, it could be perceived as a threat. You know, there's numerous ways that that could be taken uh, in that. Melissa, disappointment is a good one. Disappointment is a good one. Okay, so we will see later, later on, he still has the capacity for compassion. Anger, okay. Okay, so anger, so not just grief and sorrow, uh, but anger, because he just dies unjustly. He just dies on a whim. You know, uh, Herod, we forget, ah, I'm, I'm so mesmerized by what's happening. You just name what you want, and I'll, I'll do it. Uh, so I just couldn't imagine that's the way. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so rejection in of itself. He's, he's gone back to his hometown. And you would think that it increases. If nothing else, that increases your odds of being heard, perhaps being followed. People knew who you were growing up, but it actually ends up to them being a detriment. Aren't you Joseph's son? Isn't this Mary's son? So you've got rejection in of itself. What else do you have? Anybody else? Yes.
Okay. Yeah, I wrote down frustration. I mean, at 3 a.m., you would be, does, is there anybody who can do anything without having to, to call? Is there one person that does it, that exists, that doesn't need me at any moment? Would be, because again, and maybe I'm, I'm overlaying a little bit, but this is the human side that will wonder what, what he is combating on the inside uh, from these emotions. Okay. All in one day? Okay, so responsibility, that is still, that may not be an emotion, but that is that sense, and, and it's, it can't dismiss it. It can't just cast it to someone else. Go ahead, Bob. Sure. Mm -hmm. No, and he answers the call each time. I mean, you're right. So it, it, it does serve as an example for leaders, and it should serve as an example for us. And the thing that we cast it and didn't put it is remember that part of the invitation when he says, come to me, all of you are weak and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come and take my yoke upon you. Learn, And then he says, learn from me. And that's where we're going to pivot, and that's what we're going to take. So look at Mark uh, chapter 6, and let's look at verse 34. And Brother Bill just mentioned this a minute ago. So again, we're just taking the time to read one or two verses. I would remind you to read everything surrounding it. Uh, continue to read things in their context. But verse 34, it says, so he, he, he's gotten the news, everything's taken place, and now it's time. Uh, verse 30, the apostles returned, told him all that they had done and taught. He's excited. He tells them to go away. Uh, and now, verse 33, now when they saw them, that's the crowd, and recognized them, they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. So I don't even wait for them to get there, get things settled, and then come, like a lot of us would say. Hey, if you'll give me a few minutes, let me get there, let me get settled down, and then we'll come. They don't even wait for that. So verse 34, when he went ashore, Jesus uh, saw the great crowd, and he had compassion. So I asked this question this morning in the lesson. How does he not allow the rejection of one crowd in the city of Nazareth to impact how he sees another crowd later in the day? Because the struggle that we have is whatever this person or this group did to me here, the, all, the human tendency is to take that and I overlay it on someone else. And the way we say it is, I just took it out on someone. I take it out on someone else. So, what, what do you think about over the, over the afternoon on, on how Jesus did this? Go ahead. Okay. Great point. Okay. Yeah, and you make, you make some great observations. It's, it's not like he's looking forward to this because they're so big and need so much that his 12, as they've returned, hadn't had an opportunity to eat. So he has to specifically set them to the side, the 12. And now, but he's still teaching and he's still doing it. And now you look up and it's not that time got away from Jesus, but I can imagine... It's too late to send them back into the town for them to get something to eat. So, you know, we obviously go different route in those lessons. But he still feeds them. And this is still with a crowd previously, earlier, maybe a few hours earlier. A different crowd, albeit. But a crowd nonetheless that just outright rejected everything. So how does he maintain compassion in all of this? Okay. That's a good point. Okay, so he, he may be looking at the big picture. 
and looking at the individuals and the families that are making this up. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. That's a really good point because I, I never occurred to me to consider that part of it that all the pieces, to a certain extent, are falling into place. And I like your word that it's a transition, and that ties in with the big picture of how things are going. And it's just, okay. And you make a really good point, too. The 5,000 is not, is not one little village or one little town. It's a combination of everybody. And then they run to get to where he is. It is. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I didn't. I wrote it down in my notes for this afternoon, but the principle that's found in Ezekiel that the sun does not pay the, the sins, they, there's consequences for sure that sadly are past and sometimes they can't be avoided. But that crowd that rejected, they made their decision. That's not the 5,000. The 5,000 are not in any shape, fashion, or form indicating that they're an outright rejection like Nazareth was. Uh, and, that's, and sometimes you just got to stop and just be able, I can't do this because the Father doesn't do this to me. And he doesn't do this to my children or so forth and so on. So that's a really good, a really good observation. Yes. Yeah, that he would, he, he does with his prayer and his practices, he does shield himself to a certain extent and not taking things too far. And I think, yeah. Yeah, no. If you didn't hear what Tom said, I think that is a huge part of it. I can't. Again, people are going to make their decisions and choices, but I can't make mine to where I'm going to lose sight of what God sent me for and what I came for, uh, to seek and save the lost. And the fact that he has compassion, which, by the way, somebody tell me a definition of compassion. Kind of showing you with my belly where that compassion comes from. That's the old word. You probably heard it before. But what is compassion? You feel it in your gut. You know, it's your bowels. That it, It's not here. And it's not here, but it's, it's bottom up. And it's the deepest part of who you are. So when Jesus looks at this crowd, he feels it. Just, it's not just here, and it's not just here, but he feels it here. This hasn't been changed. And rejection doesn't, doesn't knock him off. I, I wonder if he was tempted, and I, I just a wonder and can't fill in the blank and assume. But you just got to think, what does it may take to continue to have that type of emotion towards someone in spite, and this was rather Bill's point, in spite of the rejection, in spite of the grief, because he's feeling those too. He still has the compassion on this other person or these other groups. Yes. Adam.
Sure. They have a need, and I have the responsibility, so you, you and Tom are sharing that, that understanding. And the other thing is, and there's a couple of variables. One, just from a practical side, I'm pretty sure they've been following, or as Bailey was talking about, as he's going from town to town throughout this day, this group is growing, which means that they've had a pretty long day themselves. Maybe not a full 24 hours, but they probably had a long day. But the other thing is this, how many lessons have you ever heard? How many lessons do you get? from just Jesus feeding the 5,000. If he doesn't do anything with them, if, if, if the emotion of rejection and grief get the best, and he just sends them all away and just is done with them, where do we get the teaching that God can do a little, uh, do, a, do a lot with a little? Where, where are you going to have that reinforced? The loaves and fish, but he uses loaves and fish for 5,000. If there's no 5,000, what do you do with the teaching moment? Where is it going to be the 4,000? I, I, we don't know. Perhaps, perhaps not. But if he sends them away, if he just gives in, if he just gives in to the grief, the sorrow, the sadness, the frustration, you mentioned anger a second ago. If he gives in to all of that, where are the teachable moments for all of this? Do we have this recorded for us? Do we have any of that? And if he doesn't have that, do we have Peter walking on water at 3 a.m. in the morning? Because if there's no crowd, do they need to go to the other side of the sea? And if they don't need to go to the other side of the sea, how do we ever learn that we can do what Peter did if we will just take a hold of Jesus and walk with him? All of these things, this is something we must remember that even in these worst moments, in the day-to-day -day grind of life, there are things that you today you would not have learned without them if you didn't have them you would not have learned without them very quickly yes ma'am He was. And that's a good segue to what we're going to look at. So let's look at verse 46, 45 and 46. So we're fast forward to the end of the day. He's already fed the 5,000. And we're going to look in one verse just at two disciplines that Jesus had. And this isn't the only. I mean, you look at all four gospel accounts and you will see this from day one. These are repeated habits and repeated disciplines of his. So the first thing, for verse 45 and verse 46. So immediately... He feeds the 5,000. Immediately, he made the disciples get in the boat and go before him to the other side. We, we need to get on over to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. And in 40, for, verse 46, two things. After he had taken leave of them, that would be the crowd and the 12, he went up to the mountain to pray. Let's talk about Jesus in solitude. Just off of the top of your head, how many times can you think of when Jesus just goes away into solitude? In this specific case, he goes up to a mountain. Can you think of other places and other times? Okay, so immediately after he's baptized, Matthew and Luke give us great detail in it, but he immediately goes to the desert. He doesn't go public. He goes to the desert, and of course, there is the key test and the trial with the accuser. But nonetheless, he goes out to the desert. Okay, Gethsemane is a solitude place. He still will tell the three, Peter, James, and John, even if he take, when he takes them, you still stay right here, and I'm going to go over here and pray. So Gethsemane is one. Uh, the desert uh, in the wilderness He did. Yeah. 
all three synoptics, and John does it a little bit, but all three seem to give you the, does give the indication. He often did this. So it's not, he didn't wait until it got bad. It, it wasn't, I'll do this when things get out of, you know, beyond my control. He starts it from day one with that temptation in the wilderness. He's starting that. And for three and a half years, he goes forward. Can you think of any other places? We mentioned it this morning when he receives the news that John the Baptist, he climbs into a boat. A boat is a desolate place. A wilderness is a desolate place. A garden is a desolate place. A mountain is a desolate place. So what does all of that tell you a desolate place could be? Anywhere without distraction? Okay, what else? Could be a prayer, prayer place, prayer closet. A place with no podcast. I don't know if I can make it without that one. <laughs> okay. Great point. You didn't even think about that, but even at the young age of 12, he, I'm in the temple, busy place, all kinds of things, most likely there for a festival. Uh, so you're looking at thousands upon thousands that are there, but he is in the temple. He is, he is about my father's business. Yes. Isn't that amazing? That, that it's the most common sense thing, but it needs to be reinforced. Even the one who knows everything takes the time to pray before he makes a monumental decision. Here is God in the flesh, and he needs solitude. Here is God in the flesh, and he needs solitude. How much more do you and I need it? Now the different, or I want to ask this, what are we afraid of when it comes to solitude? Why don't we like it, besides the fact there's no podcast? And I, why don't we like it? Because we don't. You do, because there's it, because what Doris said, the distractions mean that I don't have to really deal with the things I know they're there, and I can kind of keep it on the periphery. But if there's nothing taking my attention, I gotta contend with that. I I'm frustrated and angry because of things that are happening. There's nowhere for me to go. There I can't run and hide out in the open, and we're good at hiding out in the open. Okay, what else? Why else would we not like it? Okay, well, we'll circle back. Why else do we not like the solitude? It's lonely and it's boring, okay? And part of it is, is there's not, nothing can get done. All right, we are framed, nothing's going to get done. Nothing's going to get done about Nazareth rejecting, or the 5,000 aren't going to feed themselves. We frame it from that. But that's not the point. Go ahead. <laughs> From the introvert perspective. <laughs> it is a wonderful thing. Is it? Yeah. Go ahead. Good point. Yes. Good point. Right. Yep. And I, I, I agree with you just to short shorten that and summarize it that one of the things that keeps us from it is because we equate it with being lonely or alone you mentioned this and the thing is is that's true if the father's not part of it or if the son's not part of it um did jesus have a conversation with peter after the resurrection in front of everybody or did he take him on a walk and just have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with him did he did he take peter 
into solitude for just a little bit so the purpose of restoration could happen. It wasn't just Jesus that did this. We don't just walk with him out in the open. You walk with him in solitude as well. And I'm not saying that Jesus couldn't have restored him in front of everybody. He could do whatever he wanted to do. But he chose the solitude with Peter, separate and apart from everybody else, so that restoration could take place. And I wonder how many of us are missing out because of the solitude. And solitude isn't five, six, seven. It's not a monk lifestyle. We're not looking for hours upon hours upon hours. But sometimes your solitude could just simply be 30 minutes prior to everybody getting up. Sometimes it could be 30 minutes after everybody's gone to bed. Sometimes it could be the 30, 45 minute lunch that you have. Sometimes it could be the simple drive on the way to work, or on the way home. Sometimes it could just simply being here and being among everybody. The solitude looks different, but the purpose is still the same. And if you look at all the individuals, men and women in both testaments, God does some of the most amazing work when he can get them away from everybody. Yes, go ahead. Ah. It does, isn't it? Great point. So if you didn't hear, it does require be still, which is what the psalmist would say. To be still, but also be still and know that I am God. But the other is that it, it is, it's not a quick thing. You, you may not be able to do it right then and there, but at some point you will be able to. So it takes patience until that becomes a reality. Um, and it takes a lot of intentionality, too. You're going to have to almost zealously protect that time. And others aren't going to understand it, but that's okay. You know, if they want to learn, then they'll ask a question and they'll learn. But that's a great point in terms of being still, mentally, emotionally. All of those things so that space could be created, Adam. Mm-hmm. It is. It is. And we see all of them. Again, men and women in both testaments. And again, Jesus is the pinnacle of this, making time for that, which is the other part that we learn is that he doesn't go, and, and Rachel was saying this a minute ago, he doesn't go just to go. He's still going to do something, he's going to pray. And you mentioned this a minute ago, when he's making a big decision, he's going to pray. Uh, before he goes into, earlier in Mark, before he goes into new towns, he prays. Uh, the, the, the temptation, you know, he's still having, it, the prayer life of Jesus just goes. And you want a very war, uh, rich and rewarding study, is to take every reference of Jesus praying, and to just sit with those texts, and then write down what you see. And you will see Jesus just in a deep and rich prayer life. And the question that is asked all the time that is, is just something that should resonate with us. If the Son of God who walked on water prayed. If the Son of God who fed 5,000 with just a few pieces of bread and a few pieces of fish. If the Son of God who but touched a leper and he's instantly healed. And the list goes on and on and on. If he needed and wanted time with the Father, how much more for you and I who cannot feed four, five people without stressing, who can't heal no matter how many times we may kiss the boo-boo. We can't heal it instantly. And we can't 
handle and process rejection and grief and anger and frustration, which we do feel throughout the course of a day, by the way. You will most likely feel those. Maybe not on the scale that Jesus has, but we will feel them nonetheless. And if he needed prayer, how much more for all of us that need it? How much more do you think you need it? Now, we see Jesus not having a set time. We see him praying at various times. Point is, is that he just prayed. And that's where we are. But this isn't going to happen. You're not going to stumble. I'm not going to stumble into a rich prayer life. I'm not just going to trip and stumble into it. It's going to happen with intention. It's going to happen because I created that space. Maybe a mountain one day. It may be a desert another day. It may be early in the morning one day. It may be late in the afternoon one day. The point is, is to pray. And that's the thing that, when, and Beth, you mentioned this, in loneliness and boring, uh, because we're so ingrained to do. We know this. I'm not saying anything new. The best thing that we can do at the beginning and or end of a day is to always pray. Yeah. Go ahead. Great point. It is, and, and, that is, and that's a good way to leave off because that's the segue where I was going to leave. Whatever this day was recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke from the second worst day pales in comparison to that day because Bailey is absolutely right. He knows what's coming, and he's known for eternity what's coming, but now as a human being, he knows. So much so that he's going to sweat drops of blood in anticipation in that, in that same garden. Uh, and the steps that it takes and the wide range of emotions he's going to feel of betrayal and denial and obviously physical pain. And he battens down the hatches and we're just going to have a meal. And you're right, Mary anoints him. She gets it. She may not get all of it, but she gets it. And that's one of the reasons why she's the first one. Because she sees something. That maybe not again anticipating a resurrection. She's going there to, a, to anoint a dead body. But nonetheless, she does. But is it because about a year and a half, two years prior, when Martha was busy doing, Mary was busy listening. And Jesus commends her for the good portion she has chosen. We can do, 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 do all we want. We can just keep on going and we're going to burn out. The solitude is where you are restored. And solitude is where you are renewed. But it's not looking to yourself. It's looking to him. And inviting him into all your stuff. Whatever it may be. But it's not going to happen by accident. So your takeaway is start being intentional.
with who you listen to and how many days you listen to them and the intentionality that you bring to that. Slow down. Because Jesus, you're right. He wasn't quick. He let things go. But when he had the opportunity, he did it. I wonder what we will find on that. So uh, we're out of time, but if you uh, hadn't had not have the opportunity to partake of communion, it's been left in the hallway to my right, your left. Someone will meet you in room 14, and there you can partake of it together. Again, I appreciate all of you being here. I hope this series has been beneficial to you, and it's been helpful to you. Keep reading, keep looking. We're following Him, and we're learning from Him, and that's what it means to be a disciple. Let's have a prayer, and then we'll go our separate way. Father, we thank you for this evening, the time to look at Jesus' life, and we see, Father, and understand the emotions of rejection and grief and frustration uh, and just all the other things that are taking place. We pray, Father, that we will root ourselves, that we will love you and that we will love our neighbor. And because of that love, no matter what other people in our life may choose, that we, because we have chosen to love our neighbor, will not take those emotions and take them out on others. And when we have, even if that has happened today, we ask for your forgiveness and we appreciate you and we thank you for giving us graciousness and being reasonable with us and being gentle with us. And we pray, Father, that you will give us the strength as we live day to day in life under the sun and that we will remember the power of prayer and that we will give ourselves over to it, but not, all, but not forsaking the other disciplines as well. What we're doing here tonight, gathering together, reading and studying your word and just living and going and doing the things that we know, living for you, planting, watering, watering, shining light, spreading salt, and ultimately reflecting Jesus to everyone we come in contact with. We thank you for this day and all that it meant to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.